My name is Kim Wascom, and I'm the worship director here at Conduit. And my role has really changed a lot over the time that our church has grown. But um, I see my role as being an Aaron to Moses in the Bible. Um, my job is to help hold up the worship leader's arms um, to allow the worship leader to run with vision and run with creativity. And I get to put the legs and the organization to that and help fulfill people's roles in that. And it's exciting to watch that come alive. So my worship story really starts from the time before I really had memory. Um, I was born into a family that was pastors and my dad was um, a pastor and my mom was kind of his sidekick really. Both of them were very musically inclined. So, you know, both at home and at church, music was just a part of my life. It was always playing in the car, always playing at home. Um, my dad was always listening or preparing something for church or humming a song. Um, so some of my earliest memories are just learning lyrics and hearing things um, sung over me or around me. My dad's calling in ministry really was to go to churches that had experienced something that ha happened that was toxic or unhealthy and to come in and help prepare the church um, to move forward in a healthy way. And that looked really different depending on you know what it was that we were walking into. Sometimes it was um, a life of sin that the pastor had lived in or a church split, just some really awful things. So my dad just has this very healing presence um, of just being around people and loving them well and listening to their stories and so great prayer warrior and worshiper. So I saw those modeled from an early age. It wasn't until we, my dad took his seniorate, uh, senior pastorate, sorry, seniorate, um, that he, um, you know, started to realize the need that we had for volunteers. We were not in very, very big churches, like churches that were like 200 people. And as I got older, they would just ask me to, if we needed to teach a Sunday school class that morning or play the piano, whatever it was, I would jump in. And I got really well-rounded with a lot of areas of serving in the church, but there was something about the musical aspect of worship that touched my heart more than anything. And I didn't have words for that, um, but I just knew that there was something in me as a person uh, and as who God created me to be that was there for a reason. So as I got older, music was a huge part of my life. Worship became a huge part of my life. I sang in every church choir, worship team, wherever I was allowed to be part of music, I would jump in. In college is when I really started to fall in love really with worship. I started to understand that there was a calling in my life on that. Um, I started to lead worship in chapel. I traveled in summer ministry groups and PR groups basically where we would go to different churches and retreats and camps and lead in worship. So I got exposed to all different kinds of musical genres. I got exposed to people, you know, the best of the best that were brought in for special events and got to learn from some amazing people and just experience the Lord through all of these different venues and all these different ways. And that's really where like my love for it began and I really wanted to pursue it with my heart. Um, also, while I was in college and probably even a little bit before that, I was doing songwriting and, you know, loved performance and would sing in all of the choirs at school and as a senior in high school I got voted the most likely to be the next Mariah Carey which was just a huge honor in my heart because I loved her music um, but there started to be this like I don't know maybe battle is the right word in my heart for performance and worship and trying to reconcile what that looked like because I had such a love for like writing and performing but I was also developing this heart and this call for worship and had no idea how God was gonna intersect those. In fact, I didn't even, I wasn't even thinking that that was gonna be possible. After college, you know, feeling this, this pull towards ministry, and honestly, I was really familiar having grown up in that. Um, I went to seminary and um, pursued um, a degree there, a master's degree there. And I really wanted to learn more about scripture and more about, um, you know, what the Bible had to say about worship and just in general, like just wanted to deepen my heart and my life for worship. 
Um, but while I was there, I had the privilege of serving on a worship team at a local church. And I learned so much more probably there than I did in all of my four years in my master's program. And that was because of the worship leader there really took me under his wing. It still makes me emotional, like and no matter how much I talk about it, it's so important to just invest in people's hearts and invest in people's lives. Like um, he just took me in, knew that I had a heart for music, like put me on the team. And then from there was involved in my life, like my whole time throughout seminary and serving there just taught me things from like spreadsheets to going to visit people to listen to their stories. Um, they would have me over for dinner, like just truly showed me what it was like to live a life of worship and invite others along in that. Um, and a few years into that, he ended up taking a job to go work for a nonprofit. And I was given the opportunity to step into the worship leading role there at that church, which was my first time in a sole you know, ministry position on my own. Um, super grateful that they stayed there at that church. So he was able to speak into my life as I was coming up into what it was that God was gonna do in my ministry there. Um, and just encourage me and speak wisdom when I had questions or when I got my feelings hurt because it's just part of being doing life with people. Um, and at that church is really where God started to refine some things in me. Um, there were two kind of pinnacle things that happened in my life there that really developed me as a worship leader. And that was, um, you know, first of all, our, we had a man who had been redeemed from living a life of addiction with alcohol. And so he was starting to minister to some guys, not only in the congregation, but it invited some men from the Kansas City Rescue Mission to the church to be part of something called Alcoholics Victorious, which a lot of people are familiar with that program. And so not only were these guys coming in for the Alcoholics Victorious program, but they were coming in on Sundays as well to join us for our worship services, which was great. We were kind of an upper middle class congregation. And so having, um, to do life with guys dealing with addiction and with guys who really have no family or community around them was a challenge for the church, but they really rose up to meet that and to pray over these guys and to help integrate them into our church family and community. Um, and then the other piece of, um, you know, what was happening at that time was just, you know, our church going through a big transition from having one service to moving to a traditional and a contemporary service, which was a thing. Um, where we went from like singing hymns and a couple of choruses to starting to do music that was more on the contemporary spectrum. Like we think of like, you know, the Phil Wickham's and Chris Tomlin and all that. So moving towards something that seemed a little bit more culturally relevant music wise. <laughs> Having that be fresh, you know, m the fresh part of my, my own ministry was a challenge, but thankfully I had my mentor there to kind of help guide my steps. But it was also an awakening to, me realizing that I needed a much deeper life of prayer. And I really didn't know how worship fit in when things were rough or when things didn't make sense. I didn't know how to lead people and that really didn't understand it or know how to lead myself through it. So between both of these events, that service transition and then the guys coming to our church and us integrating our community with them, which meant praying over them, trying to figure out how to pray through deliverance, which we really didn't even know what that was. I didn't know what that was with them from their addictions, um, helping develop them as um, men that were now walking with Jesus, some of them. Um, I was just lost. I'm like, Lord, I don't know how, I'm in this worship leader position and I don't know how to pray through this. I don't even know how to lead myself, let alone these people that I feel responsible for, you know, to help their, with their journey as well. So a friend of mine, a mentor of mine asked if I'd like to go to this ladies prayer group. And I was like, okay, yeah, you know, that's exactly what I need right now is to deepen my life of prayer and worship. and. She said, yeah, they, there's this little group of like older ladies that meet in the basement of this church nearby. And I was like, okay, like, are we, are we going, we're going to do this. Um, and we walked in and we were definitely the youngest, the youngest ladies there, but they just embraced us. Um, they were all in their seventies, eighties. There was a couple of ladies that were nineties. I remember their floor cushions that they had, you know, sitting around, kneeling around, but they were worshiping their faces off. They always started out with worship and went into prayer. They all had their Bibles. They would pray scripture. They would pray over one another. They would pray for deliverance over people. They would ask Jesus in song. You know, I mean, 
all of these things that I was so desperate to learn, they modeled. Um, and so that one week turned into pretty much weekly for two years. And it was the most impactful um, experience of my life. It gave me confidence to approach the Lord in prayer. It taught me how to pray out loud. It taught me how to pray over people. It gave me a heart for people, just watching them bring different people in and out every week and just treating them like family, praying over them like they were just the only person in the room. Um, and they gave me skills. You know, there were there were battle skills there from scripture. And I mean, it was just, I, I can't say enough about how much that time impacted my life. And then our church really started to get into, and it sounds weird, like a church getting into prayer, but you know what I'm saying? Like prayer became a big focus for us. Um, there was a movement called the 24 seven prayer movement that our church adopted. And we started with, I think it was around Easter time, like having a room set aside where we would pray. We'd have people take shifts to pray for 24 hours a day for seven days. And I think that actually turned into like a couple of months of round the clock prayer. And the Lord really started to speak to me, um, just the culmination of being part of that ladies prayer group and moving a prayer movement into our own church. Like God was developing that in my life of worship, um, you know, outside of the stage and the musical element that I was part of every Sunday. But um, it became um, a lifeline for me. And I'm, I'm so grateful. Like that's the one thing that I think is more important than anything else. You can take all the classes in you that you want about leading worship. You can listen to every podcast. You can read every blog, but until you're on your face before the Lord and until you let him wreck you and change you and build you up into who you, who he wants you to be, like that's when you really start to lead. Um, in one of the life seminars I was part of, they talked about how um, leadership is nothing other than authentic self-expression that creates value. And when Jesus is the author of that and the fuel for that in your life, like it's life altering. And those are the people that I wanted to be around and surround myself with. So fast forward, not too long after that, the Lord called me um, to move here to Nashville, which I really thought was because I had a huge heart for music and songwriting and like this was going to be my thing. I was going to be like the next Amy Grant or something. And um, God brought me here to do the exact opposite, just like totally strip all of that away. Um, I was pushing all of the avenues to do songwriting. I had started a writer's night in Nashville. I was going to all the events, playing at hotels with friends, showcasing songs, singing background for anybody that asked. And I remember one night watching a movie where the, the um, main actor in the role was just struggling with his identity and like, who am I? And like, who am I gonna be? And, and I was just like, Lord, you know, what am I doing here? Like, I just feel like I'm doing everything that I'm supposed to be doing to pursue this dream that's in my heart. And yet I feel like I'm just meeting walls and I'm not fulfilled in any of this and I'm tired. And it, that was one of the moments that I can honestly say in my life that um, I heard the Lord audibly tell me, I did not ask you to give up your dreams. I only asked you to give them to me. And that was, there were a lot of tears after that. And I really thought that once I surrendered that, that I was really giving all that up, even though the Lord had said, you know, I'm not asking you to give it up. I felt like I still had to give it up. But when the Lord began to um, bring me to a place of stripping away all the false identities, stripping away all of the striving, stripping away all of the desire to further myself, that's when the Lord really started to shine through. He reminded me of the prayer and the intercession and the deliverance and all of the things that he had taught me and how crucial those were, not only to who I was gonna be, but who I needed, who God wanted me to be, who God needed to be me to be then. It wasn't too long after that, that um, we were introduced to Conduit, um, the church that I had at before. I just love how the Lord works. Like we were there when Darren actually got ordained, which I just, I throw that in because it's such, uh, I don't know, it's just a funny piece. Like you just never know like how the Lord's gonna stitch stories together. So trust the process. Um, but we come to this church plan and lo and behold, there's Darren who had been at the church that we were at previously. And I was able to be part of the worship at Conduit. And really the Lord started to fuel so much of my journey here, just starting with a group of a hundred people that 
just really wanted Jesus. They were sacrificing all of their funds to feed orphans and their focus was on everything that was opposite of what the rest of Nashville seemed to be about, which was smoke and lights and amazing production. But somehow it just, I felt like Jesus was lost in a lot of that. And here was this small authentic group of believers that just wanted Jesus. And that was so at the heart of who I found myself. And um, I was really, again, able to fall under the leadership of some amazing people who took me under their wing, who gave me feedback when we were worshiping, who just lived an authentic life of worship behind the scenes as well. And God really through this last like 12, 13 years of being part of Conduit has reminded me and shown me over and over again that his dream and his plan for my life is so much better, so much higher, so much deeper than anything that I could have made happen on my own. Um, and I'm so grateful for that. Like I just look back at my life um, and how blessed I am to still be able to be part of worship and to lead people in worship. And um, it's amazing, like God will use everything in your life. He'll use your brokenness. He'll use your successes. He'll use your failures and he can redeem those and he glorifies himself through it. And I'm super grateful that um, I get to be part of his story. So part of it was um, my, with my dad being in ministry and having been in a lot of different churches, like in the denomination that I grew up, a lot of people knew my dad and I kind of had that identity of, oh, you know, you're Noah's daughter. And also like being in that denomination and having traveled a lot with the schools, like I really had this identity and almost pride in that. And moving out here because I didn't get connected for the first few months of being out here, God really used that time to strip away a lot of my identity that was prideful and um, wasn't rooted in him. And, you know, all of the things that I was like, I'm this, I'm that, I'm this, I'm a songwriter, I'm all these things. And God's like, no, you're mine. And we're going to start from scratch together. And I'm going to lead you where I want you to go. Um, and not knowing the journey that would happen later in life, you know, with my mom's health issue and just some other things that had happened in our family that I was really going to need the strength of the Lord. And I was really going to need to rely solely on him and not the identity, false identity, really, that I had built for myself as a leader. And I think the world is even more so now, but I think the thing that I struggled with most in ministry and that were hurtful and toxic, were just consumeristic folks. Um, even in, you know, mentoring roles, just not having healthy boundaries in place and people's just general brokenness and in need of Jesus. If you're not careful, you end up enabling instead of discipling people. I really got caught up in that and, and didn't realize that, you know, long bouts of being in relationships with people thinking I was discipling, but really enabling. Um, and the Lord had a lot of wisdom to reveal on my journey, but there was a lot of healing that had to take place from those relationships and from those discipling moments with folks that had gone bad or mentorship moments. Um, and the Lord had to reframe my mind around what that looks like in a healthy way. Mm -hmm. So probably I would just say some of the things that have been hurtful were and generally people i mean with what my dad went through with his calling of taking healthy or unhealthy and toxic churches to being healthy places that meant that we had to weed out a lot of the time what was causing the unhealth and the disjointedness in the church so that they could move forward but that was usually sin and a lot of ugly things that um, jesus was in the process of redeeming you know by my dad being there and bringing truth and being light so all the way along, it's just been learning to see people in the way that Jesus sees us, mm -hmm. is that we are incomplete without him. We're in need of him. We need him to continually make us whole mm -hmm. and learning how to be the healthy person that comes in and um, can really and truly disciple instead of enable somebody. Oh, um, a couple things. I think um, one of them stems from when I first was invited to be part of 
the staff and leadership at Conduit, um, our pastor said, you know, hey, I just want to talk to you for a few minutes. And I was like very hesitant about becoming part of the staff here because part of my journey has been um, overwork and terrible boundaries personally and with my time and having had what I consider really terrible boundaries until going through counseling and some life seminars and having a mentor in my life who helped me work out of that and to begin to develop them for myself. Um, one of the things that I was hesitant about at this church was coming on staff and not knowing, was I really ready to test all of this that had been put into place in my life? Was I going to be able to draw boundaries with people? Was I going to be able to create healthy boundaries for myself? in ministry because when you're part of something that you love and you're called to and you're passionate about it's hard to to you know say no to things it's hard to say that i've got to say no to this so i can say yes to this better thing to keep myself going keep myself healthy but what i was super grateful for was when the pastor pulled me inside and said look i just want you to know that the way that i'm going to define how successful your ministry is here is not how many people are part of it or how great it is, but at the end of the year, are you and your husband still walking in a healthy marriage? And at that point we didn't have kids, but once you have kids, are they walking with Jesus? And I knew at that moment, this was the place that I wanted to be because for the first time I really had somebody supporting those healthy boundaries in my life. And not only that, but holding me accountable to them. Mm -hmm. So I would say that one of the healthy benchmarks of a good leader is having good boundaries in place that protect your family, not becoming a martyr, um, not sacrificing your family on the altar of ministry, as our pastor says, and I won't ever forget that because it's super important, um, but realizing that your spouse and that your family are your biggest ministry. I had a lot of those questions early on in my journey with Jesus. Like, what does it mean? When are you going to call me to something? How will I know I'm called to something? And as far as like being called into ministry with worship, I feel like there's a few key elements that the Lord revealed. One, there was a constant prodding in my heart to serve Jesus in that particular way, which for me was, was music and worship. Um, second, the church was confirming that calling and, and seeing that gift as well. Um, that they experienced Jesus through me doing those things or doing worship in, in particular with music. Um, the other thing was that you're willing to set yourself aside to solely be used by Jesus in that area. And which I think for worship ministry is just, it's so easy to get distracted. So um, having that, the calling to lean on when things get hard or confusing is, is so important. And then you're walking in this gift for Jesus and for His glory and not for your own. Um, remembering that, I think that's part of our calling always. And then you have a desire to disciple others in that. So I think those to me were the things that confirmed the calling that God was placing in my life for worship ministry. To me, worship is Matthew 22. Um, love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your mind. And it is making Jesus the, the goal, the prize of all of that. Um, and you know, to get to use that in music and in a way that I'm passionate about is the full package. But that all that I do in music, all that I do in my life would be to glorify the Lord with all that I am. Yeah, there is a book that Jack Hayford wrote called Manifest Presence. It now has a new title that I'm not crazy about, but it's called The Reward of Worship. Um, but it really opened my eyes to what worship looks like and not just referring to you know the musical element of worship on Sundays but what a life of worship looks like when the presence of God is manifest in it it really taught me about what to expect um, not only in my life of worship during the week but what to expect when we are all expecting Jesus and you know the spirit to come and to fill the service on Sunday um, so just setting a level of expectation for our worship, understanding what happens when Jesus is truly 
um, what we're worshiping, who we're worshiping, and how important it is that how I'm living behind the scenes plays into all of that. Mm -hmm. So it just talks about how to really live a life of worship, um, commanding excellence, you know, in all that we do for the Lord and how all of that comes together, mm -hmm. um, you know, as worshipers of Jesus. Mm -hmm. But it's a great resource just to help understand theologically what worship is. Um, and how that translates, you know, into your life and to be able to express that. You know, having had boundary issues in life with relationships and with mentoring, with discipleship, I, even during this time of like prayer and fasting, you know, that has been the month of January for us, just seeking out the Lord and asking God like what He wanted to do a new in my life, um, you know, God brought me back to some very specific situations, very specific relationships, and um, just called out a need for healing in those. Um, and I didn't understand what those were until I felt the Lord's calling for the next step. And that has just been to remember, you know, who was in control of those and to know that God was going to use those stories that were unhealthy in my life. and make them whole in a new way. Um, and so I really feel a renewed calling to raise up the next, I don't want to say like generation, that sounds so cliche, but I really just want to be involved in people's lives of worship. Like what does, what does your life look like? I want to show you what I see in your life of how God is worshiped in the way that you do X, Y, Z. And how do we, how do we talk about that more? How do we refine that to be more like Jesus? Um, how do we use that collectively to glorify the Lord? Um, but I feel like the Lord is already even beginning to bring some people into my life to speak that truth over and to live my own life example um, through as well. Um, it's, it's interesting how the older that you get, um, you just begin to see yourself and other people's stories. And I just pray that God can use the things in my story that weren't healthy and that He has been redeeming and is redeeming um, to help them either avoid that or to grow themselves in a different way. Trust the process. Trust the God that's leading you every step of the way. You know, even when things seem out of kilter, when things seem like this is surely not what God has for me, that it is, that God is good, that He'll bring you through every single step of where you're supposed to be into whatever it is that He's calling you to, um, but that He will use every part of your journey, um, the healthy and the unhealthy, and that, um, you know, that you won't fail when the Lord is before you and leading you. Lord, thank you so much. Maybe there's somebody just wondering if this is even for them. Um, but I pray, Lord, that no matter where you lead them, Lord, whether or not they have a platform of a lot of people or maybe just an audience of one, Lord, that you would speak truth and speak life into them, Lord. Father, I pray that we would all know how important it is to lead lives of worship and that the life of worship behind the screen, the life of worship behind the scenes is the most important. Lord, that we would be investing in that, that we would be seeking the truth in all that, Lord, and that no matter what it is, Lord, that's next on our journey, Father, that we would keep our hands open to you, Lord, and that we would trust you with every next step of the journey, Lord. Bless the person that's listening to all of this, Father. I pray that there are things in my story, that there are things in our stories, God, that would speak to them and encourage them, Lord, and remind them that you're writing our story, God, and that you're, you are the author and the perfecter of the faith, God, that you've given to us and that you're developing that in a deeper way through each next season, Lord, that you're giving us. So bless each person, Lord, that's part of this. Bless all the people that are um, have their hands in this, God, and, and people that we don't even know, Lord, that you're bringing to us, Father. We just ask that you would continue to do a new work in all of us and that we would keep you as the focus of it all, Lord. We love you in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.